Good morning. This is the usual time that every year I give you the speech that if you are in church on July 23rd, that you are the tip of the spear. Uh, you are the, the ones, you don't want some bottom of the barrel sermon that I could give in the middle of November to any Tom, Dick, or Harry who might walk in this, these doors. You want theological depth. Uh, you want uh, intellectual acuity. And I say, I'm going to try and deliver, OK? Because I know you demand it. So gravity. Let's start with gravity. Um, none of us are probably struggling to stay in our seats, right? We sit down. And gravity, OK, OK, we have a few who might be struggling to stay in their seats. But it's not the fault of gravity. Uh, <laughs> I am not struggling to stay on my feet uh, and keep my, fan, my feet firmly planted on the ground, because gravity is keeping me here. But if we were to get, uh, go with our you know, favorite best friend billionaire, who are all now building rocket ships, and we were to fly with them off the Earth and into orbit, and we unbuckled our seatbelt, what would happen? We would we go floating up, right? At almost weightless. There would be gravity. It's what, sort of what orbit means. Um, but there wouldn't be as much. There are also places, you probably know, where there is not less gravity than Earth, but there is more gravity than Earth. Um, if you were to take that same rocket ship to Jupiter, I wouldn't recommend it. It's a gas giant. There's no place to really walk around uh, or set your craft down. But if you could walk on the surface of Jupiter, um, it's so much larger and has so much more mass that gravity there is almost two and a half times the gravity of Earth. So what do you weigh? Don't tell me. Um, uh, but multiply it by two and a half in your head, and that's what you would be carrying around with you on Jupiter. So I, we probably understand, at least just like from the movies, from television, that you know there's places where there's some gravity, there's places where there's left gra less gravity, and there's places where there's more gravity. Even though we kind of experience gravity as a relative constant on Earth, we know that in the larger cosmos, it's not a constant. It pulls in certain places uh, based on where uh, mass and matter are. You might also know that time is uh, affected by gravity. You might have seen the movie Interstellar directed by an up-and-coming uh, director, Christopher Nolan, who I think has a little flick out right now. Uh, that movie, Interstellar, one of the main plot points is uh, how gravity affects time. And there's this father who's got to go off and save the world and the cosmos, but uh, he wants to come back to his little girl. And every time he lands on a planet that has more gravity than ours, he knows he loses time with his daughter because Time slows down there, but speeds up relative here. So time and gravity, these things that we experience as constants, aren't. They pool in places. When I was at the monastery in the desert uh, last month, uh, in one of the tours I got of the facility, one day the uh, chief monk gave me a tour of all the chapels and churches on the grounds. And he was explaining to me the different customs that they have when they enter churches, like you know, how they go and they greet the icons, they take their shoes off to show respect. But one of the traditions they have is when they leave church, they don't just like walk out the door like we normally do uh, any other door, but as they open the door, they turn around and they walk out of the church backwards said, why is that? <laughs> What's the reason there? And his, his reason was, because this is the church. This is, this is God's house. God is here. And so we don't turn our back 
on God, but we face God as we leave. And then he had to add, of course, of course, God's everywhere, but God is especially here. And we sort of get that. We know that in the world, in our world, that there are places, and then there are special places. If you've ever been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia and been in that room where the Declaration of Independence was drafted and signed and the Constitution was drafted, and where the year after the United States Constitution was drafted, the Constitution of the Episcopal Church was drafted, true story, you know it's, it's a special place. If you've been to uh, Gettysburg Battlefield, where great and terrible things happen, you know that like it's a special place. At the beginning of this month, uh, our family went for a couple days just north of Boston, and we toured a home that Karen's ninth great-grandfather built and lived in, her great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, uh, who was the first one in her family born in this country, built this home and then lived in it. And then her eighth great-grandfather built and lived in the house directly next door. There are museums now. They're the oldest homes in Peabody, Massachusetts. And, you know, it's an old house. And if you've ever toured an old house, you, you know, you, you kind of know what the deal is. But for Karen and me and my kids, it wasn't just another house, but this was the place where our family lived almost 400 years ago. I mean, our family built these walls and walked on this ground, and so it had sort of an, an extra specialness to it. We also get that there are places that are sacred in this world. Um, we are sitting in a sacred building on sacred ground, and there are probably things that we could think of that we might be comfortable doing on, uh, in an auditorium somewhere or a field somewhere that we might not be comfortable doing here because of its sacred quality, because it's a church almost every week. I have the experience where I'm meeting with somebody in my office and they're talking to me about what's going on in their life and they get caught up in the moment and, uh, how do I put it? They use some spicy language. It just pops out. It, and they immediately go, they'll, they'll say it, and they'll go, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. And I usually go, don't worry about it. But they go, I, I forgot I was in church. And if you scratch at the surface of that, like, well, do you not think God is everywhere? Well, yes, of course God's everywhere. But this is a church. This is a place where God is especially there's a theological um, conundrum, problem, that is called the scandal of particularity. Scandal not in the traditional sense, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this thing that happened, but scandal in the uh, original sense, meaning something that's it's easy to trip over, it's, it's hard to understand. Uh, the scandal of particularity, uh, one of the questions is, well, why did God choose Israel? Like, why did God choose the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then choose Israel? Why didn't God choose another uh, nation? And the scandal of particularity says, well, we don't have a general God. We don't have a God who is just a, like, a, like a force that like, just love and just pervades the universe. We have a God who has a mind and a will and a personality. And our God wants to engage with the world that he has created. And when you engage with the created order, you can't do it in a general sense. When you get, uh, you go to the DMV to get your license renewed, or you go to get a passport, and they ask you, when were you born? You can't just say, well, I was just born. No, they want to know the month, the day, and the year that you were specifically born, and then they're going to want to know where you were born. Well, no, I was born sort of everywhere. No, you weren't. You were born in a city, in a state, and we need to know what that was. 
Uh, if God is going to enter the created order, then there has to be a, a, a place. If God's going to be the kind of God that's going to choose a family, that's going to choose a nation, he's got to pick one. And he picked Israel. One of the questions that people ask from time to time, they'll, they'll say, you know, they have a hard time relating to Jesus. Not because they don't like Jesus, but because Jesus lived in a land that they may never have been to uh, at a time that they don't understand and relate to at all. Uh, He spoke a language that not only do they not speak, but nobody speaks anymore. And so how do you relate to this, you know, um, first century uh, Israelite son of a carpenter? It's hard. Why did God have to be born there? Why couldn't Jesus had come in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, right? There's a star on the mountain, all ready for him. You ever driven through 78 and seen the star there? Like, why couldn't he have been born? Well, he could have been born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but because if God's going to be the kind of God that's going to enter into human history and into the created order, he's got to pick a place and a time. And the place and time he chose was the first century in Israel. That's what it was. Um, Jacob, in today's Old Testament lesson, butts up against this. It's a scandal of particularity. He's sort of blown away by the scandal of particularity. Jacob's just living his life. He has just left a really stressful situation. He, uh, he stole his birthright, uh, the birthright that belonged to his older brother. He stole from him. And then his older brother was also larger and stronger than he was, and so he was really scared, and so he ran away. He, he, so he's, he's coming, he's running away from uh, his uh, larger and stronger brother. He's about to go into another very stressful situation with a guy named Laban, who will eventually become his father-in-law, and eventually he'll run away from Laban too. So he's sort of between stressful situations. Can't you already relate to this guy? And he doesn't know he's about to go into another one, but he's out in the wilderness. Uh, he's in this spot. He lays down. The, I think the strangest detail is that he uh, puts a rock down and uses it as a pillow. <laughs> and he goes to sleep. And then he has this dream, this vision. And of this ladder or the stairway between earth and heaven. And angels are going up and down between earth and heaven. And God shows up and says, I am the God of your forebearers, Abraham and Isaac, and I will be your God. And I will be the God of your descendants. This land that you are on right now, I will give to your descendants ever after. And your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And A- uh, Jacob wakes up. And he says to himself, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. I didn't know God was here. He ends up calling the place Bethel, which means, anybody? Tip of the spear. Come on, guys. House of God. House of God. Bet always means house. Uh, Like Bethlehem is house of bread. But you knew that. Um, he's like, this is the place where God is. I didn't know it. Now, again, if you go and you, like, scratch the surface there, if you're able to go back and talk to Jacob and be like, you didn't think that God is everywhere? Then you'd be like, no, no, of course I believe God is everywhere. But I didn't know how much God is here. There's a lot that goes on in this passage. Uh, God sort of makes sacred time. He sacralizes time. He talks about, I'm the God of your ancestors before you. I'm your God now. I'll be the God of your future generations, right? Like, God's like, I've been with you. I am with you. I will be with you. He sacralizes place. This place I will give to your ancestors after you, and I will be with them as their God. This place is sacred. Jacob wakes up, realizes there's something going on here. He takes that stone pillow, and he sits it up as a pillar, as a mark to say, like, something special happened here, right? Like, someone met God here, and he wants to make an offering, and he doesn't have his checkbook on him, 
and he doesn't have a sheep or a goat, but he does have some olive oil, and so he pours the olive oil out as an offering to God. He didn't know that God was there. He knew God was there because he knew that God was everywhere. But just like gravity and time pull in certain places, so does sacredness. And in this place, God really was. So in the early version of this sermon, I was then going to go off on a tangent about um, how we should prepare ourselves for also being in the presence of God, how a good prayer life and coming uh, to worship and uh, remembering everywhere we go that each place is sacred and looking for God. I might have uh, brought out uh, Brother Lawrence again, who wrote that book uh, in the Middle Ages, Practicing the Presence of God, where when he's washing dishes, he's remembering that he's washing dishes with God. And when he's making his bed, he's remembering he's making his bed with God. But then, the more I sat with the story, that's not what this story is about. This story, while I like to give you a little homework at the end of a ser- service, a sermon, Uh, And especially you all, um, the tip of the spear at church in the middle of July. This story is not about that at all. Jacob does nothing to prepare himself for God showing up. This story is is absolutely not about Jacob doing anything at all. He doesn't get get down on his knees, oh Lord, come to me tonight, or be here in some special way. We don't hear about some intense prayer practice that he has. He's just living his life from one crisis on the way to the next crisis, and God shows up. This story is not about what Jacob does. This story is about what God does, what God always does, and that is enter into our story, into our world into our life generally and into each of our lives specifically. Now, Jacob does do something afterwards. He recognizes it. He offers uh, an act of worship in response to it. But leading up to it, he didn't earn it, deserve it, coax it up. God just showed up. There may be a few people among us here today that might be just living life between one crisis and another crisis. There might be some among us here who are just sort of like going along and living life like Jacob. And to us, I would say, God shows up. We don't know how. We don't know when. Like Moses, we might be completely surprised about it at the burning bush. Like Jacob, we might be completely surprised about it when we see the ladder going from earth to heaven. Like the disciples, they might be completely surprised about it when they see Jesus uh, transfigured on the mountaintop. Like time and gravity, sometimes sacredness just bubbles up under our feet, not because of who we are, but because of the God that we worship. Amen.